Hello, and welcome to today's Thwack Camp session, What Does It Take to Become a Practice Leader? This session is actually a follow-up from your comments from Thwack Camp 2017, where so many of you were curious about how to get started with something new in your career, and that's transitioning to leadership. Even if you don't want to be the CIO or the CTO, many successful professionals have found a way to bundle their years of experience with some atypical enthusiasm to lead, not just manage IT. So the question is, is this a career change that you might want to consider, or at least a, a focus area that you might want to spend some time on? So joining us today are Teresa Miller, founder of 24 by 7 IT Connection, and Pumla Schmidt, Cloud Ops Advocate from Microsoft. Thanks so much for being here this year. Thank you for having us back. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be here. It is just great to have you. And so many of our regular uh, viewers and uh, SWAC members interact with you uh, both on a regular basis, and it's just great to have you here. Well, when we started thinking about this session, we realized that we weren't just talking about skills development, but we were really talking about career development. And as logical as most engineers are, we don't always think about career. I mean, we think about the work, but not always maximizing our lifetime work opportunity. And leadership, especially practice leadership, may be the road that you're already on, even if you don't realize it. So I'll start with a question uh, for Teresa and Pumla, uh, because they both began their careers in technical roles, but have ended up with careers in leadership. Um, they realized that there was opportunity to drive real change, not just make IT run smoother. And there are lots and lots of paths to that, but it means something different for everyone else. So let's start with the obvious by defining what is practice leadership. Who wants to go first? Oh, that, that's a tough one. I, I think when you first asked me this question um, a few days ago, I thought about like, it's really the same thing as thought leadership. And I'm like, am I really a, a thought leader? I just do what I do. And what I do is share knowledge. So to me, a practice leader is somebody that shares their knowledge among others so that they can gain that knowledge uh, and experience. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty basic concept. It's, you know, someone says, hey guys, let's wrangle everybody in. Here's what I know. Let's just do it. And if you don't know something, I'm going to teach you. Does it ever feel like it's almost an artificial title or kind of a, I don't want to say markety yes. title, but like trying to put a title mm -hmm. on something that really doesn't have one. It's something that you sort of do and you know when you're doing it, but it's almost externally labeled. And you don't even realize you're doing it sometimes. Uh, I, I've uh, actually, it dawned on me a while ago, I wrote this blog post and I thought, should I really write this? And it's just something really simple about expanding um, the C drive on the running VM mm -hmm. using uh, this Dell utility. And it was funny, I posted it thinking, oh, everybody knows how to do this. Apparently, not a lot of people did. <laughs> and I uh, you know, had a lot of comments like, wow, that was, you know, that was a great article. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, I, I assumed everybody knew how to do that. And not a lot, not a lot of people didn't, or didn't know how to do it. So that made me go, oh, wow. There's a, there's I, I, there must be more that I know that I can share with everybody. Right, there's that sort of opportunity to be a master of the long tail content, right? Where mm -hmm. there'll be a blog that's the official vendor blog on how to do something, but then they don't know all the pitfalls or what could happen. That only comes from experience. And so that is a hugely underserved area in our industry is someone, if you know, have the knowledge and you can actually produce a really great blog and make it, make it available to everyone, it really does help them. So Teresa, for you, what's the, what do you, how do you define practice leader? So practice leadership to me, at least as it started for me, um, really came down to the sharing knowledge as well and having a desire to reach a larger audience than just my peers at work. You know, I looked up to a lot of people in the industry, the people that I learned from and what they were doing and sharing um, information on, on websites and blogs. And it was... Um, they were mentors for me. I think. I think you know, it, it, it's a mentorship. There's confidence that comes from it, and you know, never assume that what you're doing um, won't help somebody. So it's it's so many different things. So mentorship sort of is another one of those labels that's oh, yeah. really sort of. Yeah. Um, mindful helpfulness, right? Not, instead of just being helpful or throwing something out there, but actually working a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with someone. And that that's a big part of it. Do, do you find that you sort of 
made, I don't say transition, it's not like you suddenly change who you are when you step into a leadership role, but that the, uh, the first step towards that was a lot of that that you found yourself being helpful, like, 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 like the intent of help was a big part of what drove it. Co Absolutely, co yeah. Like co coaching, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as my career progressed and I became a senior engineer, a lot of the uh, technicians and the you know, level one engineers as they're doing the work that I used to do, I'm seeing some of these mistakes and you know, to me, I naturally want to help. Right. So you know, I would send them screenshots or say, hey, let's, let's set up a meeting and let's walk through this together because I'm noticing you're making the same mistakes or the mistakes I made. Here's how you, know, um, you can avoid some of those pitfalls I had. And it just, you know, it just slowly progressed into that and where if you, if you see somebody you know, making some common mistakes, you just naturally want to want to fix, you know, want to help them. And maybe that's the mother in me too. Yeah, you know, I seem to want to fix everything or take, take yeah. care, take care of people. Well, I think to add to the mentorship piece too, for me it's actually led to even some more formal mentorships as well. So I'm part of the Citrix user group community right. and we do uh, women, to, women to woman mentoring in that area because there's obviously some, some need for, for more females in our industry. Um, someone I work with um, on the other side of the globe um, reached out to me and we meet routinely to just go through things so that he has the opportunity to get exposed and learn and grow um, in his role and, and maybe that even means more for him in the long run. So it's, it's neat how you know, starting out just by initiating some blog posts mm -hmm. in the beginning and speaking at a conference has now opened some doors the other way as well. Right. right. Or, 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 well, our story. Yeah. How, how, I, I sort of kind of was like, hey, you need to start blogging. And when, when we first met, well, like five years. Well, I was wanting to, yeah. yeah. I, I was like, oh, I you should was, really do it. It's, yeah, you know, I was wanting to. I just needed the push. Yeah. And then I, <laughs> I encouraged her. I'm like, oh, you really? And then you got to start a Twitter account. And next thing you know, it, you know, we like we're joined to the hip. Yep. And we, we mentor and coach each other daily. All the time. Yeah. Well, the, uh, one of the, <laughs> well, well, there's uh, someone on, on the, the SolarWinds team that uh, actually has been doing amazing uh, run books and great documentation and uh, just really what would be really nice 2,000 word blog posts with charts and graphs and really great diagrams. And we were talking the other day and it's like, yeah, you know, I thought about blogging. I'm like, I've seen your work and you, you, are, you are natural for this. So instead of thinking of it as like this layer that you add on top of that I must start to blog or I must participate in a podcast in order to sort of be, to move into the leader ranks, that's not really necessarily true. Do you, do you find, and actually you, you mentioned it, it's, maybe it's the, mo the mother in you. Do you, f do you think maybe it could also just be that that helpfulness comes from the desire to be helpful in technology just as a part of who we are? It's what draws us to, yes. to it in the first place. Like if you're just starting your career and you're working the help desk and you're doing desktop support and all of the awfulness that comes with that, right? You're, you're earning your bones in your early days, right? That's a, it's to be helpful. I don't, mm -hmm. it's like, it, yeah, we think of it later as complex service delivery and a lot of other things, but it starts with a desire to help. Yeah. You, you wanna help somebody, they have a problem, they have an issue, and you wanna fix it and help, it, help them so their day is better. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately it just comes down to that. I, yeah. yeah, I mean, just with her, same thing, and it, it, like, hey, you should really blog. You know, it's, it's great, and now it's like, we do it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah every, every week. You know, there's something out there, so. And there's yeah. other people that have come up to me at conferences yep. and said, oh, I'm really interested in doing this. I'm like, do it. Do, yeah. you, do you find that the, the sort of immediacy of feedback when you blog or if you participate in a, in a uh, community that you know, you, you, you're almost afraid the first time you do it that you're gonna look at the comments. And they're, oh, and they're, yes. They're gonna eat me alive, it's gonna be awful. And mm -hmm. instead, that that feedback actually helps you find your voice because they are, they are eager to respond to your being uh, helpful and that they tend to actually be more supportive than anything else. I was gonna say, unless you're aggressive in some way in that post, which is not typical, right? Yeah. And you're being helpful and sharing knowledge, the feedback is always positive, and that leads to the confidence, right? It's there's confidence building that happens over time, and and that's you know you, you end up seeing people speaking or, right. or having opportunities opportunities of your own to speak, and and it just grows and grows from there. Well, I I, I think that's interesting. You know, when you you think about the times that you've been to a convention, for example, or you're watching someone that's 
I mean, maybe a TED Talk's not a great example, but you're watching someone who's presenting something I on love YouTube. I TED Talks. Who, who, but you're, you're watching someone who's presenting something, and they're not, they're not super removed from it. They still do it every day. They just mm -hmm. happen to be talking about it. And it's easy almost to forget that they weren't born that way. They, they, they became that. They, they learned how to stand on stage. They learned how to blog. They learned how to, how to sort of formalize that into a visible leader role. But for a lot of, a lot of um, uh, admins and people in operations, they are actually a little bit more tactical. They're on the ground. So maybe they look at someone who's presenting in a large environment and say, well, I could never do that. But you look at the quality of how they're moving their organizations forward, how they're actually kind of the Pied Piper that gets everybody behind that impossible CIO project. Mm -hmm. They're doing it just like anyone that you would say standing on stage. Yeah. yeah um, one of the things that I've learned is if you talk about something that you know about and you're passionate about, it just comes naturally. Mm -hmm. It, it, it really does. And then you said, when someone's watching you, they're like, oh, wow, they really know their stuff. Well, they do. And when the, the content that I speak about, um, I'm very picky about what I pick, you know, what I talk about. And so if I pick something, it's got to be something I'm passionate and I know, and I really, really know the content because when I'm up there, I'm speaking from the heart. So it, it's, it's real. But if you're just going up there to talk, people can see right through you. And that, that's one of the, I guess, things that you kind of have to watch out for if this is something that somebody wants to do. Like you said, it, doesn't, it, it wasn't something that I set out to do. It just came naturally. So now speaking on stage, you know, that, that whole phase of it is natural. But I actually have stage fright. I don't like being in front of people, but I do keynotes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I speak in front of hundreds of people. And it scares the living daylights out of me all the time. Like, but I just do it. And then once I'm up there and I'm you know, looking at the content I have to present, oh, I know this stuff. It's just like at work when I speak to the guys, you know, or if I'm presenting um, a project that we're trying to you know, um, go live with. It's just, you just put yourself in that mode and say, okay, I just gotta present this like a project at work and, and, and there you go. And I know this stuff. It's what I do, I, I live and breathe it. So the other thing I could add to this, so we're all in IT, the audience is in IT, right? So we all have a natural passion for learning. Mm -hmm. You have to, to be here. And so for me, when I first started out, I, um, a senior system administrator, had done some really cool projects with my teams at work. I was looking at attending a conference. I knew nothing about calls for papers, mm -hmm. calls for topics, and I'm like, you know what? I can't sign up for the conference yet. I might as well, I just on a whim submitted some topics to a conference. And some, the wind blew the right way or the wrong, I don't know what happened that day, but I was selected. And so um, I think sometimes you just have to be willing to put yourself out there a little bit. And that was the most challenging speaking opportunity I ever, ever did. I'm up, you know, I'm, I've got all of these names in the industry sitting in my session. I'm like, wait, okay, what did I do here? But put yourself out there, be a little courageous, and, and then it kind of falls into place. And, and, and know that the rock stars had been in your shoes before. And I'm sure that before they go up and speak, they're probably nervous and thinking, okay, oh, wow, well, you know, <laughs> you know, taking a deep breath or doing whatever tricks they need to do to, to get relaxed. Because I'm sure most people are not that natural on stage or, oh, I really love going on stage and talking to people. And almost everybody I've spoken to, you know, you, you, get, you get a little nervous before you go up in front or, or of people. Or you have that moment where you're invited and you're, you're, you prepare and you're confident beforehand and then right before you just have that moment where you take a breath and you say, I really wish I was just writing code right now, didn't have to do this. <laughs> and then you hear yeah. your name and you roll out and then you discover that you're among friends. And what, what, I, was right. gonna, what I was gonna say was, uh, you both touched on it and it's really, I, I'm curious is, do you think we have an advantage or that there's more opportunity for our audience to actually consider uh, leadership and whether it's writing or speaking or just working with the team, that there's the barrier to entry is actually lower because we talk about what we know because we know so much. Like part of this career is constant learning. It's constant, mm -hmm. um, uh, ad uh, you're adapting new technology and so you always have something to talk about where there are some other industries where maybe that's not true or maybe it's more academic or it's mm -hmm. secret information, it's more propriety more proprietary and we are all about sharing. So there's so much to share that I don't think anyone ever expects 
expects us to talk about something that we don't know. Sharing is caring. It, yeah. it really is. If you if you share your knowledge, uh, it's just it's amazing. It 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 comes back. You know, it's just a bit. It's just like the circle of life. <laughs> yeah, the Lion King. Yeah, it's it's just it just constantly comes back. It, and we're always in a constant learning process. My model is, we're humans. We don't know everything. So if you know something, share it. Because you know, I'm sure there's somebody out there that, that doesn't know it. If you're sharing what you know, it's 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 real. It's genuine, mm -hmm. and your audience is going to perceive it very well. They're going to ask questions. They're going to come up after if it's a speech, or if it's um, blogging. You're going to get the comments, right? Well, and I think, and, and maybe this is this is for both of you too. Is I enjoy the questions at the end of the presentation, the ones after you yeah. step off more, because those are the hard ones, right? That is someone who has real pain or, or maybe just frustration, but like they're trying to move something forward and it's something you've done a million times. And so you can just explain, walk them through step by step, give them your Twitter handle or email, and then walk them through that. And for you, it's, it's very efficient because you've done it. And for them, you're making their life better. And you, you go to bed that night, and you're like, oh, OK, I made the world a little bit better place. So here's a question for you. Why do you think, and you've both been through this phase, why do you think that technologists have a habit of just sticking to their work, maybe not mm. thinking about the career as much, and just sort of assuming that eventually there'll be senior comp involved, and they'll have Extra, extra opportunity, and many careers are very, very successful following that. But why do you think we tend to, to, to kind of hide behind that instead of taking a risk maybe to up-level our, our visibility? <laughs> we just talked about that at breakfast. It's like, yeah. a, it's like this myth of if you do good, they'll reward you. Well, it doesn't always happen. We're the, we're the last of the pension workers. Yeah, because I've worked countless hours on projects, and there have been times where I wasn't rewarded. You know. But you just you keep working and working and working, and nobody's acknowledging you. That that's the real life, you know. That it it sucks, but it's it's happened, and um, it's a shame that you you know sometimes you're not acknowledged. But that's where you have to be your own advocate, and I, I've learned that that you have to be your own advocate. If um, you know if you're working hard, let people know that. And if somebody sends you a good email, it says, "Hey, thank you for helping me out. This was awesome. You helped our." you know, our team or you help the company, keep that email. Put it in a special folder. You know, champion, for, be a champion for yourself. What about, what about being a champion for, for others? And I know there's... That too, because that, well, uh, that helps others, that helps boost their confidence. I mean like your, your reports, like let's say for a manager, because a lot of leadership is, is, is leading by example or just mm -hmm. enthusiasm or, or whatever it is that you get people behind the idea. And that's one of the nice things in tech is we're all about ideas, right? But you have, let's say, a manager who is operating mostly out of an HR mode. They're worried about comp and everything else and vacations, and somebody's got a sick cat, and they can't come in that day. But is there a special opportunity for those uh, managers to identify uh, employees and team members that show leadership opportunity? Because that's that thing where mentorship, we don't usually do a good job. And I don't know whether it's they feel threatened by that or, or what, what causes so, that. So my perspective on that is that if they're a true leader, they will they will seize that opportunity and not be threatened by it and not hold somebody back. They will help build up their team and help those in the team grow. So I almost have, um, I almost don't even prefer to use the term manager because I right. feel like that means something different. So we want leaders that are willing to step up and help. And you'll find that in some enterprises because of the politics, there, there's not as much as that as there should be. Whereas in other organizations, you get the right person in there, the right people, the right team, and they will. They'll help. They'll help each other um, exponentially. And if it becomes part of team, then that that growth and that that leader will will be able to um, help well, those. Well, that, that feedback that you're giving to your to your team or your staff, it goes a long way because if someone feels appreciated and acknowledged, they're only gonna do even better, like, you know, do more and do better. Like, wow, that made me feel good. You know, if my director would send me an email that says, oh, thank you for a great job you did and your team did a wonderful job, that makes me feel good, you know? And I, and I would share it with the team, like, look, 
we did a really good job. And I, I always try to make sure that I thank the guys every day. Thank you. You know, if we have a team meeting, thank, thank you for, you know, doing this. You guys work hard. If you let people know that they are doing a good job and they are appreciated, they feel good about what they're doing, especially the long hours that we work, the ridiculous 2 or 3 a.m. calls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're working 36 hours straight. I mean, it's, uh, IT has the worst hours. We're like doctors, but we fix computers. Mm -hmm. And a lot, oftentimes it's unappreciated. And when you get just a nice thank you, it feels good, especially from the users. Mm -hmm. When users send emails that, that say, hey, th thank you for helping me, Oh, it makes it makes my day. Or you, or you have that one where it's an accidental compliment. Yeah. You're in the lunchroom and you overhear the table next to you, and someone's saying, "I don't know what happened, but you know our email is just so much faster than it used to be, and it just works." Oh, <laughs> like, yeah, I know how that worked. <laughs> right, but we we like to. I, I think in in technology, we like to be heroic in that we like to know that this system cannot operate at its peak without me. Well, we like but to fix we don't things. Want to, but we don't. Oh yeah. But we don't want anyone to know that. So I'm, I want to talk. Let's talk about that for a second. So th you talked about uh, listening a minute ago. And so part of that, that, that mentor, the, you know, mentoring is as much about listening as anything else, right? So identifying that, that, that employer, that team member who might actually be able to really take on some leadership responsibility. I am sure that you have both had nothing but fantastic management who has always been excited to help promote you and, and, and get your voice out there and actually have you work on personal brand. But what do you do when you realize that this is an opportunity for you, that you're actually beginning to, people are starting to really listen to you when you speak, where management doesn't get it, where, to your point, they might even be afraid to let you, to, to have somebody, somebody's threatening. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you work past that? I mean, just quit and go do something else, or can you, in an organization, help build space for that? Well, first, first you bring up a good point about listening. So let's maybe take the example of, let's, we're sitting in meetings, right? And so I think it starts when you're working with your team. So if I'm in a meeting, and all I do is talk, 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 and don't let anybody else have a chance to speak, I think that can, can pose negative, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you take the opposite and, and say nothing because that person is dictating the meeting, that also is negative. You need to find a balance in those meetings. You always need to speak, even if it takes a lot of effort to get past the person that's, that, that wants to run the conversation. Find the gaps and insert yourself. I think that is a, an excellent way to be noticed and show that your points, and they're valid, they really are. Don't be afraid to speak, bring up what's on your mind. Paying attention to the meetings, mm -hmm. be, being engaged, being in the meeting. Not in your uh, laptop? Yeah, I, I mean. <laughs> I mean, you try not to. You, you try not to, but uh, I'm in a lot of meetings and We've got engineers sitting next to me, and they're just typing the way, working the way, multitask. We all multitask. But if you are actively engaged in the meeting, you're present, that makes a huge difference versus someone that is sending three emails and is also working on, a, on an issue. To me, that person that's paying attention and asking questions and then you know, being engaged in the meeting means a lot more than that person that is multitasking. And I will actually, after the meeting, pull the other person aside and say, next time, let's be engaged in the meeting. Uh, you know, let's follow along. I know you may know the content, but there may be something that you, know, you don't know, or maybe you know and you can share more information. Mm -hmm. Because when you're not engaged in that meeting and you're not, or you're not present because you're thinking about something else, mm -hmm. that actually um, hurts your team. It, it hurts whatever you know, meeting that you're in if you're not fully engaged. Um, I've had to stop myself, you know, because I'm multitasking. I go, I tell myself, okay, I'm in this meeting. Or there's a sub one yeah. issue that's got to be addressed. Yeah. I, I, and at that point, you have to pull yourself out of the meeting. Right. Excuse yourself and say, I have an issue. I need to, you know, to leave because you're you're just hurting that situation, that meeting, by not being present and listening. Oftentimes, I'm in meetings where you've got somebody asking all these questions, but we've already gone through that content. So, so now you're like circling back again and you're like, oh my gosh, you know. So some tips that I, I mean, I think everybody 
deals with meetings differently, but things that work for me, if the phone comes with, it's upside down. And I always bring either my mental thoughts or a pen and paper. I will not bring in a, another electronic device in the room because it's so easy to get pulled into an email that just popped up on the screen um, and things like that. So to support the be present, it's so, it is extremely important. If you're gonna have a, a human conversation, Absolutely. use human technology to do it. And right. then those are, I mean, but that's what's gonna make you stand out in a meeting. You're engaged, you're contributing, and you're, you're, being, you're being heard. Did, did, did one or probably both of you might have just noticed this. Did you, did you have a point in your career where, you know, I think in IT we, we complain a lot and, oh, and, yes. and there's a lot of whining because there's a lot of things that we just don't have control over. And it's either technology budget or time or all three, right? But did you, did you find that there was a point where you would begin to speak at a meeting and the room would get quiet? That, that the engagement, that, that the words that you were using were actually being heard by everyone at the table. And you realize that I'm saying something now that is going to probably affect some decision making going forward. And that you had to do the sort of turn that around and think about, be really thoughtful about what you're saying to make sure that you're decreasing uh, friction and noise and making sure that you're really encouraging that engagement on the team. Like, was that a, a pivot point where you realized for some reason when I speak people listen a little bit more? I, I don't think so, but I think I, I, I couldn't say that this day and this year I like remember something like that happening. But what I can tell you is that when I um, made the conscious effort to stop and really think about what I was saying and, and worked to simplify what I was saying so that it came out clear that that point uh, stands out to me. Um, if you simplify things and make a statement, it's it's heard much more than just you know stream of consciousness. A, yeah, just letting a bunch of stuff out, and then nobody really knows what to do about what you just said. It, it could come off as whining. Yeah, and confidence. Mm -hmm. Speaking with confidence. If you're gonna whine, <laughs> uh, speak with confidence. You can complain, whine, but also have a possible solution. Put it all, you know, make the comment in a way where it, it's not so negative. But one of the things that I've learned is always speak with confidence. Even if you're, you know, inside you're not quite sure, if your tone has a, a tone of confidence to it, it's taken more positively rather than, oh, well, he doesn't really sound confident. And, and I've, I've coached others on that in, in meetings where they, they really want to get their point across, but listening to them, it doesn't sound quite like they know what they're doing. We're like, yeah, I, I, I think it'll work this way, but inside they know it's going to work that way. It's the words they yeah. choose. It's if you say, I think, I might. Or the tone of it, say, the tone. it's going to work this way, and here's why. So is a lot of that is a lot of that come down to just uh, preparation, where a lot of times if maybe you're just working tickets or you've got uh, you're you're pulling uh, Kanban cards off the board and just kind of uh, getting through as many tasks as you can, it is sort of stream of consciousness. I'm just doing something. You show up at, at a meeting or whatever, but to stop and think and like to actually, oh, I don't know. In your meeting request, you have an agenda. Yes. Right, take, take the time to make some points. And I, and I like Pumala's point about options. Sure, we just, we have this challenge. You don't want to whine about it. You want to stop, think, and come back with one, two, three options for the team to discuss. Mm -hmm. That's a productive meeting. And everyone gets to participate, and everyone is heard if they choose to participate. It, it also comes back to some soft skills on knowing effective ways of communicating, speaking with confidence, using the correct words, and even your body language. Mm -hmm. You know, s sitting in the meeting and sitting up straight, not slouching, not uh, it, it, put your laptop away, th things like that. It, it, it makes a huge difference uh, when you're speaking to a group and they're like, oh wow, that person really knows what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. But inside, they may not, because trust me, I fooled some people too. <laughs> you know, you know when, you're, when you're going through some issues and they're like, do you know what the problem is? Um, I'm not really sure, but I will find out. And Absolutely. You, 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 say it, you, you say it in a confident way 
deep down inside, I'm probably going, oh my gosh, I really have no idea what's going on. And you're sweating it. And you just want to get back to your desk so you can figure out the issue. But it's just, it, it's that perception. And you just got to, I hate to say this, but fake it until you can feel it. And as you practice being confident, it just comes naturally. Or, or identify other people who sort of started in the same roles that, that you did mm -hmm. and have taken on, taken on this new role. And it's interesting because you're really talking a lot about soft skills, mm -hmm. right? Even though you would think of, you know, the word leadership by itself just sounds like strong and clear, but really it's about, it's about humans, right? Mm -hmm. So for those soft skills, um, Puma, you've talked about um, developing a, a support system, right? So how do you how do you do that? Because when I go out and Google build your own support system, um, I get lots of technology <laughs> answers back, right? But that seems to be one of the big things that holds people back is yeah. that it's soft skills are not anything that we're compensated for. I mean, we are, but we don't know it. We don't recognize it. So it, does this all sort of hinge on developing those skills? And if so, how do you? find them if you don't have a, a, a formal mentorship program, for example. I had a college professor years ago, um, and of course I was studying IT at the time, right? So, um, and especially at that time, we weren't even considered social creatures. Right. <laughs> We're in the basement, and, and the lights turned <laughs> off, and just coding. You but, know? He, but he said, he said, take the time to build your web, your network of people, because over time, over the years, you may need to look back for support. And so at the time, um, LinkedIn didn't exist. So I literally did what he said though, from a social perspective, I picked up the phone or we could text. <laughs> I texted somebody or I sent them an email. I said, hey, let's go grab lunch, even if I didn't work uh, with them anymore and kept growing it. Now. Tools like LinkedIn have made that much easier from a professional perspective. Twitter, Twitter. Um, even even Instagram you see used um, for, so, uh, for business and social. Those tools make it a lot easier. But build your web, build your network of people. It will take time. It's not going to be there overnight. Um, user groups are great. Mm -hmm. Conferences, and not everybody has the um, ability to go to conferences. It, it does cost money. So user groups, oftentimes in your local area, they're free. Go meet people. Um, or if you know someone at another company that you previously worked with, it, invite them to lunch, invite their coworkers. Hey, let's, let's get together. And you kind of build your own network there. Um, you know, if, you, if somebody's leaving your company, hey, let's keep in touch. You got your email address. It, little things like that that's, that's building your network. Because at some point in your career, you may, you may need them or they may need you for a reference. And that's, that's how I started, I guess, my network. It's just keep in contact with people and say, hey, you know, we worked well together. Let's, let's share contact. Uh, now, you know, with Twitter, you, you could be Twitter famous. And yeah, I'd go out, start a Twitter account. Like I, yeah, like I, I encouraged Teresa. Um, it's that, you know, that doesn't always build a brand, uh, but, you know, it can, to, you know, and also the, uh, the forums, there's a lot of, DWAC is a, is another one, mm -hmm. all the different communities go out there. If you, if somebody posts a question and you know the answer, answer it, answer, comment. Yeah, my, uh, my wife, who's uh, going to be presenting in one of the uh, security sessions a little bit later in the camp, um, started speaking at Jenkins user groups here in Austin, right? And that was a great way to start because there's 20 people in the room and they're all friends and they've seen work that you've done before. And so getting that confidence that then results in a year later, she's standing on stage at Jenkins World yeah. doing a presentation. That came from starting at that, at that local user group. And I, I think... You see that more now, maybe in some people who are younger uh, practice leaders, is that they almost all seem to sort of start uh, with AAA presentations, and then it gives brands and it gives other leaders and it gives mentors a chance to actually identify them and encourage them. So it's interesting how you brought up your wife. To her, speaking at that user group, was it like a real speaking event? Did she make it feel like a real speaking event or it was just, I'm going to this user group and I'm gonna talk about you know, this topic? Uh, because it, it starts out like that. I'm talking with a bunch of friends that I meet up and we talk about technology. It's, it's that small little steps like that because to her, it's a user group. I'm sure she's friends with all of them. And you know, it's, she was probably very comfortable speaking about the topic that she knew about. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's that first step. 
the network, and then it just kind of branches out like a tree. Right. It, it just go. It just goes from there. But it, but it goes back to being able to speak about what you know about. If you know the content, oh, you're then you share it. Yeah. But, that's true. But I will say, and this is something that, that I watched her do, and I've watched uh, many other practice leaders do, goes back to preparation, which was, yes, she was just going to a local conference to speak, but she was speaking about software-defined Jenkins, basically, for CI/CD pipelines. And so she was nervous about it, even though it was a room full of friends, people that she knew from communities, so she prepared for it. And so that's one of the things that I see a lot of times in people who are practice leaders is that they, and, and to your point about being ready for that conversation, even if it's just a meeting, like to be really thoughtful about what you're going to do before you do it, it makes it really easy to capitalize on what you know mm -hmm. and then sort of package it into something that's useful. Absolutely. Uh, if I present on a big stage, I've practiced. That very first time I spoke at a conference, just out of the blue, I had my iPad out, I was recording myself, I was studying my facial features, I was practicing my presentation, and I did it over and over. And that helped cut through the nerves. I was nervous, but it helps get past. That. Well, it's kind of like you, you know, you, you think of some careers where if maybe someone is in on on-site sales, for example. Mm -hmm. They practice. A lot of them will practice that conversation in the mirror at the hotel before they go on site with the customer. Hey, how's it going? Talk about your problems today. They practice it. So, like, mm -hmm. why wouldn't we in technology, even getting ready for a big meeting, just take? 10 minutes and look at our deck and actually practice going through it instead of like, well, this is one more problem that I can solve. But So is that something that you learn or is it innate? Is it just you tend to be more prepared and that's part of how, if you tend to be that person, you should automatically consider yourself uh, that leadership is something that you that you want to really contemplate as a career or is it something that's that you can really learn and magnify in yourself? I'd say it's learn because uh, I didn't go into this thinking I'm going to be this practice leader. Mm -hmm. To me, it was, I want to be prepared for the meeting, or I want to be prepared for whatever I'm doing. I want to, you know, I want to rock it. That's pretty much it. I, I don't like to fail. I really hate failing. So for me, preparing and knowing my content, knowing basically what I'm supposed to do is just being there. And it just naturally progresses to doing a good job. And then people go, seeing that and going, oh, wow. Okay, she knows what she's doing. Yeah, I think if you want it, if it's something you desire, then you'll figure out how to make it happen. It doesn't have to be natural. You don't have to be born able to speak. I think I'm most not people <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, do, you, do you feel like one of the things, like to go back to the, the subject, yeah. To, yeah, but to go back to your, your subject for social, for example, that, that idea of like, really participating and taking a chunk of your day every day and supporting social media or doing personal branding or really working on visibility or I guess it all comes down to self-promotion. That's something that most people in technology really don't like to do. Like I, I, I'm perfectly happy to uh, talk about technology all day, but you all know this. I never, I'm an engineer, I never intended to, you know, kind of end up on camera. And so that process of almost being, you know, someone has to kind of remind you, yes, you're doing all these things, but you do need to actually have visibility on Twitter or on Instagram or on LinkedIn or among, like pick a user, pick a user community and just be really, really active there. Um, how do you, how do you help technologists get over that sort of, not exactly shyness, but reluctance to suddenly push yourself out and, and build a brand. If you want it, you'll do it. Uh, you know, everyone started at zero. Yeah. Everyone started at nothing. So you've got nothing, nothing to lose by trying. And if you right. don't, yeah, and if you don't do it, you're not gonna get there. Yep. It's not, and it, it takes time yeah. too. And it's not gonna come to you. It's not gonna come knocking on the door for you. You have to go out and get it. Just going back to my point, you have to be your own champion, your own advocate. If there's something that you want, and if you think this is something you can do because you know, you've got a lot of knowledge, you wanna share it, reach out, blog, you know, reach out to your network. I mean, create a Twitter account. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's not gonna be instant root no, solving. It, 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 it's it, going it, to take it some time. It is not no. instant, it takes, it takes time. Um, because you also have to build that credibility too. Mm -hmm. When you know, when you first come out, people are gonna they're gonna they're not gonna question you, but they're gonna ask questions. They want to see if you know your stuff. I mean, because uh, social media could be pretty rough. 
And if you read some of the comments, it, it, it's it's just it, it is what it is. It's, Troll, it's, it's Trollville. Yeah, it is Trollville. But in a way, there there will you know the trolls will um, I guess question your credibility, and in a way you kind of have to you know toughen up and say I know my stuff. Or mm -hmm. and then if you don't know it, acknowledge I don't know this. This isn't this isn't my you know expertise. Or, or a lot of times you'll realize that it's a cry for help. And if you go back to that sort of helpful core, you can help address their address their challenge. Mm -hmm. Sure. And and then all of a sudden, almost you have an opportunity to turn someone who's really being difficult and social to actually being a, a champion. Yeah, you know, you mentioned too something about being able to advocate for yourself. That can be very hard because there's, a, a, I feel like we were probably all raised like there's the bragging piece, but mm -hmm. there's yeah. there's advocating, and there is a big difference. Um, there definitely cannot be arrogance, you know, in advocating, or it doesn't Humble advocating. work. Yes, um, I also up here in in uh, the industry of mine um, on the Citrix side, she had a very hard time getting used to advocating herself. First of all, it was culturally challenging, like in in the the country she's from, um, but she's she's learned that. Um, you know, I think when it, when it's done in the right way, it's it's okay to do. And I think you have to. It goes back to our entire conversation, even of if you want to be noticed and promoted at work, you have to be able to say um, that I did this. Um, I think we all want to assume that people just know. People don't know necessarily that you did something or that you put in a 20-hour shift to fix something. Or you want to believe that they do know that, but I think you need to call that out. And in the same, so it's it's in the workplace, it's in the community, it's across the board. It needs to become part of your life. You have to be able to speak up for yourself. So in terms of like seal of approval. I think most of our audience is really familiar with certification, and so many of them have lots and lots and lots of uh, uh, certificates. When you look at recognition, something different, like being an MVP, and I think you, you're both the experts, right? So is that something that you strive toward as a part of raising your visibility, or does it just sort of come along with that journey where you suddenly are out there more, and you're, you're presenting, and you're helping, and you're actually leading? I think for me, it just came naturally. Um, I don't strive for it, mm -hmm. but if there's an opportunity there, sure. Thank you, and, and I'm always very humbled by it. I think if you start out going, I want to be that, uh, yeah, it, either it won't happen or um, it doesn't happen the way that you want it to. Right. So be, be yourself. And don't go into it thinking, I want to be this rock star either. Because it's, uh, it's not always cracked up what, you know, what it looks like to be. Um, yeah. There is pressure. Because, uh, I mean, personal experience, I got imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are days I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I, I think we, we all go through that. But there is a little bit more pressure from others that are you know your audience their community like you they feel like you know everything and i don't you know we're, we're humans we, we don't know everything so you know i always have that caution it's this is great but at the same time there is a lot of this pressure to know everything and you just have to understand that you don't know everything it, it's just not humanly possible mm -hmm. so if you just go in with that correct mindset you won't feel that pressure do you, I was going to say, do you think that there's um, uh, not so much pressure, but maybe concern that if you become, uh, you, you have an interest in becoming a practice leader, and you do it, you're almost always going to do it within the company that, you, that your interest presents itself, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think we worry, you know, is it actually portable? Can you pick it up and take it to another job? Or is it tied, is it domain specific to the company that you work for, right? Is it, is it an asset that, Helps move you forward, or or is there? Should they actually worry that? Well, if I really you know raise my visibility in the company and actually start pushing forward, pushing projects forward, that I'm not I'm no longer interchangeable, or maybe I'm less portable because I'm not spending my time on certifications and specific buzzwordy skills that show up in my LinkedIn profile. I I think that all. Uh, Almost, almost anything you could do is is uh, is portable to another organization. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the like the community recognitions you mentioned, like the expert Citrix CTP at Microsoft MVP, 
Those are all portable as well. It might not feel that way when you're first starting out, but it, it completely is and moves around with you. It's part of you, um, especially if it's natural. Like you said, I think a lot of that was natural for me as well. It was a natural progression. Um, not anything I ever dreamed to do. Like, you know, it wasn't like when I grow up, I want to do this. It, it just happened. So, but that's that authenticity, that sharing, just mm -hmm. it, it all just stems from within. You know, if you're, if you're sharing knowledge within your organization, and if people know this, they, they, they will. The pe people will acknowledge. I mean, it'll potentially get promoted up in different roles or, or get special projects. I mean, it, it, do, it does happen, but again, you have to advocate for yourself. And if that company isn't doing that, there are other companies out there that, you know, they may see your work. In fact, you know, my last job, uh, they knew my social media presence. They, they were fully well, or actually, they, they heard of me, so that's, I don't want to say that's how I got the job, but they, they knew of my online presence. So it, Your handle went before it. Yes, yes. Every, uh, my VP knew Exchange Goddess, so it was kind of like, oh, we're interviewing Exchange Goddess. So <laughs> it just kind of worked itself out. But um, I don't want to say it helped get the job, but it, it, it was a conversation topic, and it sort of gave some uh, credibility as well. And you were demonstrating a lifetime of work and skill just as a part of that, that recognition for what you do, or somebody can go look at something else that you've published and say, okay, well, this is not someone who's sort of the, um, the uh, popular person of the, of the year, but instead this is someone with a whole career that can right. speak. Well, um, we're, gonna, we're actually about to run out of time. So uh, last question for you is imagine you're um, visiting our, 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 our booth, let's say, at Cisco Live, or um, uh, reInvent or some other, some other event. And a lot of times customers will come up and they'll just talk to us about a lot of things that have nothing to do with specific technology, but about, about career and skill development and the rest of it. So you overhear this conversation and you realize that this person actually is demonstrating a lot of the innate qualities that would make them a great practice leader. Mm -hmm. What would you give them? If you just have a, a minute to talk to them and say, here's where I would start or here's my advice, what would you, wanna, what would you want them to know? I, well, I think first of all, calling it out and saying, it's very clear to me that you would be really, you have great knowledge within you and it, you'd be really great at sharing it. I think, you know, provide that, that little confidence boost to, to help them. Um, I actually know somebody like that where I've said to him, I'm like, you know, you really should be writing or doing something different to share what you know, because I can just tell, you, you know, you've got it. And, it, you know, but, you know, sometimes people want to take that opportunity and others don't, but it's the confidence. I just went through the same thing. I just, uh, you know, had um, someone on, online that was like, hmm. I actually went to them and said, I think you would be great as a, as a blogger um, or, you know, really sharing your content. Um, I actually, then I referred them. I said, do you mind if I refer you to somebody um, to be able to share some of your knowledge more? And they were like, oh, wow, I, I, I never even thought about that. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, yeah, it, it, in a way, I was giving back to what the community gave to me and mm -hmm. enabling them to potentially grow their career and say, hey, you might want to talk to this person. They have some opportunities in, in reference to blogging or um, reaching out to community. But then the other thing is don't wait for somebody to tell you to do it. If it's something that you're feeling inside of you, I say just do it. Well, I think that's a really great way to really wrap this up. I mean, you're talking about identifying, I know, creating room to identify um, leadership in yourself in terms of being helpful. Right, being fearless and experimenting, like being part of a community and maybe doing starting small with uh, presentations to small groups and discovering that what you have to say is actually helpful and to draw on all of the expertise that you have. That I love the idea that maybe um, practice leaders, it's it's not something that you you go and bolt on, but instead it's actually it's a part of you and it's just waiting to come out. And so identifying that, and for um, those in our audience who are watching this session, a lot of you probably probably already feel that as well, right? You, you've noticed that you are leading conversations among your team and that people seem to care about what you say and that maybe you're being a little bit more thoughtful about preparing for meetings and, and starting conversations because you realize that you really can help 
whether it's yourself, your career, or maybe the CIO with their wildest ambitions in actually moving technology forward. So Pumal and Teresa, thank you so much again for being a part of Y Camp this year. You bet. Thank you again for having us. It's always so much fun. It is a lot of fun. And we hope that you've enjoyed our conversation and that it's got you thinking about how you might consider a career change or at least a tweak toward leadership. Not just technical leadership, but change leadership that really does help your organization actually accomplish its most challenging goals. Be sure to follow Pumala and Teresa and all the expert guests visiting Thwack Camp again this year. And we're sure that you'll learn a lot about moving past forcing change by sheer will and instead that you very well could be the leader that makes it easy for your whole team to focus on projects and finally resolve issues. And more than that, you might even be ready to make a real change to make leadership a skill that you'd put front and center on your LinkedIn profile. And if you'd like to learn more, make sure you check out some of the event sessions at thwackcamp.com. For Thwack Camp, I'm Head Geek Patrick Hubbard, and thanks again for watching.